Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on non-communicable diseases. Before you watch this video, make sure you, uh, you're you competent with communicable diseases, because this um, crops up in a couple of places in this video. I've got a video on that earlier in this playlist if you need. Now, in this video, we're going to be looking at what non-communicable diseases are. Then we'll look specifically at cancer, liver disease, malnutrition, cardiovascular disease, and obesity as examples of different kinds of non-communicable disease. So let's start by looking at what we mean by non-communicable disease. A non-communicable disease is simply one that cannot be passed on from one person to another. And we're talking about things like cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular or heart disease, stroke, dementia, uh, liver disease, and so on. Now, all of these are awful diseases, um, but they cannot be passed on from one person to another. If you've got diabetes, you can't give it to your friend or your neighbour uh, or whatever. If you've got heart disease, they're not going to catch it from you and so on. Now, with non-communicable disease, it's better to think of risk factors rather than causes. So what we mean by risk factor is something that may, makes it more likely that you will develop this because what we find with this is that there's a good dose of chance involved in non-communicable diseases, but there are things you can do that can make you more or less likely to get them. Now, one of the big risk factors is, is your genes. Now, some genes make us much more likely to get cancer or to get heart disease or diabetes or so on. You will probably be aware of in your family there are some diseases that are more common so in my family for example high blood pressure and stroke is more common i know in other families things like dementia are more common and those are all because of these genetic risk factors that don't make it definite that you'll get one of these things by any means they just make it a bit more likely the other big risk factor set of risk factors is to do with your lifestyle. Now, we can't affect our genes. We can't do anything about it. Our genes are our genes. We're stuck with them. However, with lifestyle, there are things that we can directly influence. So we're talking about things like your diet, um, how much exercise you get, whether you drink or smoke or do drugs. Now, these are all things that are, to some extent, in our control. However, changing them is never easy. So the first non-communicable disease that we're going to spend some time looking at is cancer. Now, cancer is a disease caused by cells which start dividing uncontrollably to form these lumps of tissue that we call tumours. Um, now, we can see that here. So this is an X-ray of someone who's got lung cancer. And we can, the, the healthy lung tissue looks dark like this area here. But you can see these white lumps here. These are the tumours growing in this person's lungs. Now, Cancer kills us because these tumours, once they get big enough, little bits of them can start to break off and um, lodge elsewhere in the body. We say um, when you hear about someone having stage four cancer, that's, that's what we mean at that point. Um, and those tumours will then grow elsewhere. And it starts to just affect the way that all of our organs work because we've got these lumps of tissue growing where they shouldn't be. And that's what kills us. Now, cancer is an awful thing. Um, and about 40% of us will develop it at some point in our lives. Um, really important to note it's not necessarily the death sentence that it perhaps once used to be and there are lots of treatments now um, and survival rates for cancer are improving all the time now in terms of risk factors for cancer um, genes are a definite risk factor so for example um, women with mutations in their BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes are much more likely to develop breast cancer uh, than those without them. It doesn't mean they definitely will, but it's it's a really high chance, like around 80 or 90%. Um, and um, if you are from an Ashkenazi Jewish population, you are much more likely to have BRCA1 uh, or 2 gene mutations than um, people who are not of that uh, population. And so lots of people from Ashkenazi Jewish backgrounds will get themselves checked for those genes and they'll take preemptive decisions about breast removal surgery and replacement with prosthetics um, because their chance of cancer is so high. The other set of factors are around lifestyle. So for example, we know that smoking makes you much more likely to develop lung cancer. <clears throat> we know that eating lots of red meat and processed meat like bacon, ham, sausages, and so on 
makes you much more likely to develop bowel cancer. And we know that spending lots of time in the sun without sun cream makes you much more likely to develop skin cancer. The same applies if you're spending lots of time on sunbeds as well. Um, now, in terms of skin cancer, um, it's just, just a bit of a public service announcement here. If you've got moles on your body that are these irregular shapes or they've got these irregular colorings, um, these are all potentially cancerous moles. In fact, you know, these ones here are cancerous. You may have some on your body that look like this, uh, in which case you should definitely go to the doctor and just get them checked out. It's also worth noting that um, although skin cancer is more common in people with lighter skin, because we have less melanin to protect us from the ultraviolet light, skin cancer can often be worse in people with darker skin when they get it because these harmful moles stand out less against darker skin. And so they're often detected much later once they're at a more harmful stage. So the lesson here, people, is just A, wear sun cream and B, check yourselves regularly. Now, our next non-communicable disease to look at is liver disease. Now, the main liver disease we need to know about is called cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is a chronic liver disease. A chronic disease is one that you live with and can't be cured. Um, so it's a chronic liver disease in which normally functioning tissue is replaced by non-functioning scar tissue. So if we look at the picture here, this is a healthy um, liver. This is what your liver should look like. And this on the right is one with cirrhosis. And you can see it really doesn't look healthy at all. Now, the main risk factor for liver disease is drinking alcohol. And we can see that here. We've got a graph here of the risk of liver disease versus the amount of alcohol you consume each week. And you can see there's a very clear and um, positive relationship. The more you're drinking, the uh, more likely you are to develop that liver disease. Um, and it's also worth noting um, the red line is people who are drinking with meals versus the blue line people are drinking without meals and so again you can see the risk is higher if you're drinking just on its own rather than with a meal um, other risk factors though are, 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 there's a liver disease called hepatitis and the hepatitis types b and c increase your risk of liver disease and cirrhosis um, obesity increases your risk of uh, liver disease as well now our next one is malnutrition malnutrition is about having too much or too little of particular nutrients in your diet so we often think about um, malnutrition as being diseases like rickets so this is rickets here this is caused by a lack of vitamin d in your diet and it makes your bones soft and so they start to bend like this rather than being able to, rather than holding your weight fully there's another one called quashial cause so if you see um, news articles um, about uh, famines taking place in the world you can often see children with these very swollen bellies like that and that is a very unhealthy child who's suffering from quashier core caused by not having enough protein in the diet now too much uh, of particular nutrients especially carbohydrates and fat can lead to conditions like obesity when you see this person here is experiencing obesity now in terms of the causes of malnutrition there is definitely genetic causes so some genetic conditions for example the disease cystic fibrosis makes it difficult to absorb enough nutrients from your diet making it more likely that you might get things like rickets um, and also lifestyle as well so poor diet has a massive effect on malnutrition as does lack of physical activity so our next kind of non-communicable disease is cardiovascular disease. Now, cardiovascular diseases are diseases of the circulatory system. That is our heart and our blood vessels. So an important example of that is a heart attack. Now, a heart attack happens when the heart stops beating due to blockages in the coronary arteries that supply the heart muscle with oxygen. So if we look on the diagram here, we can see we've got these arteries running around the outside of the heart and they're bringing blood and all of its oxygen to the actual heart muscle itself to keep it beating. Now, sometimes what happens is we get these blockages start to build up in those arteries and that can make it hard for the blood cells to actually pass through. And eventually it can get so bad that it gets entirely blocked. And so the, the blood cells can't get through to a particular part of the heart. And so that part of the heart stops beating and that will lead to the entire heart.
stopping beating. Now, another important cardiovascular disease is stroke. Um, now, stroke happens when we get similar kinds of blockages, but rather than blocking blood vessels in the heart, they block blood vessels in the brain. And that starves parts of the brain of oxygen and can lead to them to be either severely damaged or even to die. Um, and that can cause very disabling uh, and very significant effects uh, and even death. Now, in terms of risk factors, um, there are genetic risk factors, but there are also important lifestyle risk factors. So a big one for heart disease, um, uh, cardiovascular disease, is smoking, because smoking causes harmful substances in the tobacco to damage your blood vessels. And, and we can actually see that in this graph here. So what this graph here is showing is that um, is is showing your risk of three different kinds of heart disease. So there are three different um, diseases there shown there. So that's what each of the different colored bars is. And this is showing how your risk uh, changes after you give up smoking. So you can see one year after smoking, the risk is really high. And three years after smoking, the risk is a lot lower. So there's a good news story here in a way, which is that although smoking damages your heart, it's never too late to stop. Because if we do stop, we can see that over time, that increased risk of heart disease starts to drop. Now, another big risk factor is obesity. Um, and that's often due to high cholesterol diets, um, which can then lead to high blood pressure, which makes heart attack and stroke more likely as well. So how do we treat cardiovascular disease? We've got a couple of different options. Um, one option is surgery to fit what we call a stent. Now, we saw before that with our um, heart attack, it's being caused by a blockage in one of the coronary arteries on the surface of the heart. So what we do with a stent is we insert this kind of mesh tube like that into that blocked artery, and that just opens that artery up and allows the blood to start flowing again. Now, the good thing about this stent is it is an immediate fix. Um, I, one of my best friends, had uh, his dad had a heart attack um, about 20 years ago when he was like 40, and he had a stent fitted, and he's, he's you know, 20 years after it, he's doing really well, super healthy now, um, no issues whatsoever. So the stent immediately fixed the problem. Um, the downside of the stent is that all major surgery carries risks and side effects, and there is the potential to die during surgery as well. Another potential option is heart transplant surgery. Now, this is great. The patient gets a new healthy heart. However, there is a limited supply of donors. Most people want their hearts, so we can only get hearts from people who have died, and they have to have died with healthy hearts, and they also have to have a right tissue match for the person who, who needs to receive the heart. Um, equally, transplants may fail. Um, it's not always a successful operation, and um, it often means that the patient needs anti-rejection medication for the rest of their life to prevent their immune systems from attacking that new heart. So heart transplant surgery, again, it, it can be good, but there are also limitations as well. So what about non-surgical options? Well, we could take things like lifelong medication, such as statins. Um, statins are a really good medication. Most of your grandparents will probably be taking these on a regular basis um, because they are prescribed to all people in the UK above a certain age. Um, and these can help to reduce the risk of heart attack and stroke. However, they can have harmful side effects. And to keep that low risk, you've got to keep on taking them for the rest of your life. It's not like you take it once and you're done. You've got to take it every day for the rest of your life. Um, and also lifestyle changes. Now, lifestyle changes, we mean improved diet and getting more exercise. Now, this provides a permanent solution. This will fix the heart disease. However, it takes a long time to take effect. It's not instantaneous. It takes months for the effects to show. And it may be that the patient is already too ill to be able to do this. So may be forced to go with one of these surgery options instead. Now, our next issue we're going to look at is obesity. Now, obesity is around having excessive fat accumulation um, around the body. So we can see someone here of a, um, a healthy weight and someone here is obese 
And the difference between those two people is that the obese person just has more fat accumulated around their body. Now, this is associated with an increased risk of all sorts of non-communicable diseases, um, including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, arthritis, and some cancers as well. Now, it's important to note this bit around increased risk. There are plenty of obese people who aren't experiencing any of those things. You know, my granny was obese her entire life, and she died of old age at about 94 or 5, I think she was, you know, so the obesity for her wasn't a major problem. However, for plenty of other people, it really is. So this is why we talk about risk factors um, rather than particular causes. Now, in terms of causes of obesity, there is only one cause in a very simplistic way, and that cause is consuming more energy in your food than your body uses. However, the reasons why you might do that are very, very complicated. And this is why it's important not to judge people um, who have obesity. So, you know, we know that people with poor mental health will often eat because it provides comfort and helps them feel better, at least temporarily. Um, we know, for example, that the unhealthy food that um, uh, is more likely to make us obese is both cheaper and takes less time to prepare. So, you know, imagine yourself in the position of a parent who's got a low paid job and is maybe having to work two or three jobs in order to pay the rent, to pay the bills um, and to buy enough food to feed the children. Well, then in that situation, you might not have the time to cook and you might not have to cook well and you might not have the money to be able to afford to um, buy good food. And so you're forced to eat this less healthy food. And so obesity is then much more likely. So it's important we don't judge people, but try to understand what's led them to that obesity. Now, in terms of measuring obesity, we've got two different measures. The first one we look at is what we call the BMI. The BMI is the body mass index, um, and it is calculated by dividing your mass in kilograms by your height squared in meters. And this gives us a number that ranges from below 18, below 18 would be underweight, between 18 and 24.9 is a healthy weight, between 25 and 29.9 someone has overweight, and 30 to 34.9 is obesity, and 35 plus is severely obese. Now, you don't need to memorise those ranges, but it is quite common in an exam, in an exam to be given some information about someone's body mass index and to have to match it up against a table containing this information and to make a judgment based on that. Now, let's see an example BMI um, calculation. So let's imagine someone had a height of 179 centimetres and a mass of 76 kilograms. What is their BMI and which range is that in? So BMI equals your mass divided by the height squared. Now, in this case, the height is 179 centimetres, but we need the height to be in metres. So our first step is going to be to divide that by 100 to give us 1.79 metres. So when I substitute into my equation, I'm going to say my mass is 76 and I'm going to divide not by 179 squared, but by 1.79 squared like that. Okay. And if I put that into the, into the calculator, I get 76 divided by 3.2041. And that gives me an answer of um, 23. 0.7196, blah, 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 blah. And I'll round that to three significant figures. Um, always go with significant figures in, math, in uh, science, unless you're told otherwise. And three is always a good number to go with. So I'm going to round that to 23.7 to three significant figures. So 23.7, if we match up against our ranges up here, that falls in this, um, not in that range, that falls in this range here, between 18 and 24.9. So that puts this person at a healthy um, weight. Now, just as a, a little aside, it's worth noting that BMI isn't a perfect measure by any stretch of the imagination because it assumes that someone's heavy, 
because their body has lots of fat. But actually, they may well be heavy because their body's got lots of muscle. And in that case, they would have a high BMI despite being perfectly healthy. So BMI is a really widely used measure, but it's really not a very good measure. Now, a better way to measure obesity than using BMI is what we call the waist to hip ratio. Now, the waist to hip ratio is a very simple calculation where we divide the circumference of your waist, that's the distance around your waist, by the circumference of your hips. Um, you'll notice that there are no units on those because the units don't matter, um, provided they're both in the same units. And this gives us our waist to hip ratio. Now, the reason why this is a better measure than BMI is because it measures um, where the fat is. And this is what the waist to hip ratio gets at. So fat around the waist is less healthy for us than fat around the hips. Um, it's known that fat around the waist and around our belly, it produces more of certain harmful chemicals that damage our blood vessels and increase blood, blood pressure, cause inflammation and things like that. So although they're both fat, not all fat is equal. Now, if we look at our ranges for um, uh, waist to hip ratio, again, we don't need to memorize any of this, but you might need to be able to interpret it in an exam you'll see that we've got a couple of things that are worth noting. For example, an excellent waist to hip ratio in females is 0.75, whereas in males, it's 0.85. Um, um, an at-risk waist to hip ratio in females is greater than 0.86, in males, it's greater than 0.9. So there are a couple of things to take from this. First of all, we see that the healthy ranges for females are lower than they are for males, and this is due to women having uh, or, or females having wider hips in order uh, to enable childbirth. And so that means that their waist to hip ratios should naturally be lower than for men anyway. The other thing that's worth no noting is generally a lower value is better than a higher value because it suggests you've got narrower waist than you have hips. And so you've got less fat around your middle. So let's look at an example of how to calculate this. So here's this person. They've got a waist circumference of 95 centimetres and a hip circumference of 102 centimetres. So how to calculate this? We can say the waist to hip ratio equals our waist measurement divided by our hip measurement. So that is going to be 95 for the waist divided by 102 uh, for the hip. Now, the units are both centimetres, but if it was millimetres, inches, metres, miles, kilometres, doesn't matter as long as they're in the same units. And this gives us a value of 0 0.93137 and so on. But I don't need that amount of accuracy. I'm going to round it to three significant figures because that's always my kind of standard unless I'm told something else. So 0.931 as my final answer. And if I compare that against the table, it actually doesn't matter whether this is a male or a female person. It's above the um, uh, at risk range for both of them. So this person is definitely at risk and um, you know should be considered uh, to have obesity. So that's it, the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.